Tonight on Join News Prime, just when Auditor General Daniel Domlevo was getting ready to return to work at the end of his protracted leave, he encounters another impediment as the Audit Service cites disparities and anomalies in his past now records with the public service suggesting he attained the retirement age last year. We we'll bring you a correspondence between the Audit Service and the Auditor General on the matter and reactions to the story from persons we have been involved in efforts to see him back at post. Former President John Mahama urges all Ghanaians to go in for the COVID-19 vaccine after he received his jab at the police hospital here in Accra. All Ghanaians should avail themselves of this vaccine. And indeed in Africa, we should be less hesitant about taking vaccines because all of us take vaccines as we're growing up. That's Antehino 24822 was also the first person to be vaccinated in the Shanti region. Showed the vaccine and then has drawn the vaccine into the syringe and has just injected Otunfo on the left shoulder. So Otunfo has received the vaccine. Members of Parliament's appointment committee suspend the recommendation for approval of six of President Kufado's ministerial nominees, including the three the minority MPs rejected. And then we'll bring you business news. My name is Israelai. Journey's Prime is coming to you live from our founder of our studios at Kokum Limli here in Accra on your digital terrestrial TV because we're free to air and also on DSTV channel 421 and Go TV channel 144. This is a home of independent, fearless, credible and impactful journalism. Stay tuned in. That's Antihino Tumfo said to the second is taking a jab of the AstraZeneca vaccine in Kumasi. He is the first to take the jab in the region, followed by his wife, Ju Lady Julia. Other chiefs also took turns to get vaccinated. Nane Aljima gauged the first day of the vaccination exercise in the Shanti region and father's report. Just injected Otunfo on the left shoulder. At midday, so the Asantehini took the first jab, the supervised by the director of the Ghana Health the Service in the Shanti region, Dr. Immanuel Tenkran, deputy director for clinical services in the Ashanti region, Dr. Rita Larsen Rindolf, ran commentary on the process. The public health nurse has explained the procedure to Otunfo, and then she sanitized her hands showed the vaccine and then has drawn the vaccine into the syringe and has just injected Otunfo on the left shoulder. So Otunfo has received the vaccine. You need to seek consent because you can't just um, get up and inject somebody. This is a procedure, it's an injection. So you need to explain the procedure to the person. I think that there has been a lot of concerns that we are not putting on gloves for this vaccination process. But the fact is that for all injectable vaccines so far that the Ghana Health Service has been administering, it's been the same procedure. We do not wear gloves, but we make sure that you sanitize your hands or you wash your hands with soap and water before giving the vaccine. Because in wearing the gloves, it means that you need to change the gloves in between. Other chiefs, including occupants of the silver stool, Asante Mamponhine, Dasebra Osaibunsu II, took turns to receive the shots. Here are some of them. It was like we've just been pricked. Nothing, there was nothing to it. So I'd encourage a lot more people to take it if they have the opportunity. I had it about 10 minutes ago. I'm fine. There's nothing new. So we encourage everybody to go and get a job. They asked me my age, my date of birth, my name, where I live, where I took the vaccine. So at least the dates that I took the vaccine and the, the three months that I need to do the revaccination. At the Regional Coordinating Council in Kumase, other dignitaries also took turns to take the job. There are other places in the Ashanti region, like the Kumase South Hospital and other hospitals where similar process will be undertaken. The Ashanti region has taken delivery of 150,000 doses of the AstraZeneca vaccines. 
The Regional Health Directorate has deployed 112 teams for the vaccination exercise, which will be carried out mainly in Kumase and Obuase. Dr. Emmanuel Tenkran is Director of Health Services. We have 150,000 doses of COVID-19 vaccine, AstraZeneca vaccine, and uh, we are going to give to 146,000 people. Because if you have 150,000 doses, there is something we call wastage of about 5%. So that means that uh, if you take the wastage into consideration, you are not going to immunize exactly 150,000, but about 140 to 145,000. That is the number, that's our target. The first day of the exercise had been described as fruitful. Health experts believe persons administered with the vaccine will serve as ambassadors in dealing with the public misconception about the vaccine. For Joy News, Nana Ojima reporting. Well, former President John Mahama was at the police hospital for his vaccine, after which he told he urged all Ghanaians to, as much as possible, to go in for the vaccine. As you can see, I have my certificate in hand. Um, as you said, I was replenishment ambassador for Gavi for many years. So I've been a vaccine advocate. So I'm, I'm very familiar with the field of vaccinations. Um, I believe that all Ghanaians should avail themselves of this vaccine. And indeed in Africa, we should be less hesitant about taking vaccines because all of us take vaccines as we were growing up. I mean, it is due to vaccines that today our children don't get mumps and yaws and measles, rubella and all those sicknesses, smallpox has been eradicated, polio has been almost completely eradicated it's due to vaccines. And so vaccines are something that are useful to preserve our health. And so I think that people should discard all these rumors about the vaccine. I agree to take it publicly so that I will send a message to everybody that these vaccines are safe and that all the funny rumors that are going around on social media are just hoaxes and that people should um, ignore them. It's a personal one. When you first took it, what was the reaction like? Um, it's like any vaccine shot I've had. Uh, growing up, I've had many vaccine shots. And uh, for those of us who travel, we know that we take yellow fever vaccines every 10 years. And so... Well, the Food and Drugs Authority says it will, in the next 10 days, complete findings on the evaluation of two vaccines from India and China. But it says extensive work has been done on the vaccines currently being rolled out across the country. Head of the FDA, Dilis Mimi Daku, says the authority is taking delivery of other vaccines for evaluations. He spoke at the press launch of the COVID-19 vaccination exercise in the Ashanti region. We've worked on another vaccine um, that is called the Sputnik vaccine from Russia. As soon as, once we do the evaluation to ensure that it is of the right vaccine, the ministry will do the purchasing. We also have another two vaccines, one from India, one from China, that we are evaluating. As soon as we've done this, we'll let the minister know, and then they can go ahead with all the other plans for making sure the vaccine is available. So that means that we have about four at the moment. We're also in discussion with another three more companies. And once they bring their documentation, we'll evaluate it. When we do this sort of thing in a pandemic, we use not more than 15 days. That means people work even Saturday and Sunday to review their documentation. So in a pandemic, we review this in 15 days. So in the next 10 days, we'll have finished with the other two and let you know whether it is good to use or it is not good to use. It is not automatic that we'll by all means approve the vaccine. Well, the FDA says the AstraZeneca vaccines which are being used in the country have mild effects. We as the Food and Drugs Authority, we are what you call a maturity level three agency described, uh, listed by the WHO. We are also a regional center of excellence. There is no way that will allow a vaccine that is not safe, that is not of the right quality to be used on Ghanaians. So just to assure you, the vaccine is safe. 
it is efficacious, it is right that we use it to ensure that we can vaccinate as many of the population to enable us to um, attain what we call herd immunity and bring the coronavirus down. If we don't, it will run wild in this country and we don't want that to happen. So just be assured that even after you use the vaccine, we are still monitoring. There are very few side effects to this vaccine. The side effects to this vaccine are actually very mild. They are the normal side effects that you would get when you use any other vaccine. A bit of chills, maybe a bit of headache, but within one to two days, it is gone. Even after that, we have a good safety monitoring system in place that will ensure that everybody who is vaccinated will be followed up to ensure that if they experience any of these mild side effects, it will be reported to us, it will be managed by the Ghana Health Service team, and we will put it in our database just so that we have a database for Ghanaians. Well, we have a comprehensive report on the first day of the rollout of the COVID-19 vaccine across the country. We'll bring you that in a bit. But right now, after 167 days of false leave, Auditor General Daniel Domolovo is due back at post Wednesday to resume his role as the Chief Auditor of Government Spares. There's, however, a hitch. He's been told disparities and anomalies in his personal records with the state suggest he's supposed to have retired last year. We'll be showing with you correspondence between the Auditor General and the Audit Service on this issue shortly. But let's first give you a background to the matter in this news desk report. Daniel Yao Domelevo, with his infamous coat during an interview following his decision to surcharge former senior minister Yao Safomafo for allegedly breaching the Public Procurement Act that resulted in their payment of one million US dollars to a private UK firm, Kroll and Associates. Mr. Safomafo then sued the Auditor General and four other officials of the finance ministry to clear their names. His was one of many state entities Mr. Domelovo was investigating, but on June 29, 2020, President Ekufuado directed him to proceed on his accumulated annual leave of 123 working days. The presidency had relied on sections 20 and 32 of the labor law and also a precedent set by former President Atta Mills when he asked the then Auditor General Edward Dua Ajiman to proceed on leave. But the move was criticized by some civil society organizations which read meanings into the decision. The President has no power to exercise any control, disciplinary, whatever, financial, administrative, managerial, none. Days after this directive, Mr. Domelovo wrote back to the presidency urging President Ekufuado to reconsider the directive as it was unconstitutional. Daniel Domelovo said he had observed that his work was embarrassing the government. Following this letter, the presidency extended his leave by an additional 44 days. Government maintained the decision of the president was well grounded in law. A sitting president has exercised the powers under the Labour Act reference to somebody in the audit surface in this manner. I do not recall civil society groups coming together to do a press conference. And Several pressure groups, political parties and civil society organizations, including Occupy Ghana, CDD, the NDC and anti-corruption campaigners, including Vitus Azim, spoke against the directive and urged the president to recall the Auditor General from his leave. First, we believe the decision of the president is not proper and needs to be reconsidered. The action gravely weakens the president's fight against corruption. U.S.-based Ghanaian lawyer Professor Kweku Asari took the campaign a notch higher when he sued the Attorney General and two others over this directive arguing it was illegal and inconsistent with the letter and spirit of Article 1877 of the 1992 Constitution. Within the first month of proceeding on leave, the locks on Mr. Domelovo's office were changed on the instructions of the Audit Service Board, chaired by Professor Duyajiman. Yeah, but the key cannot even enter. Uh, I hope you see that it was flat like this. Yeah, and they've changed it to this one. Professor Diajiman defended this action, saying the move was to secure the office. There is a problem about the, the, the office, the, the laws. The board has every right to make sure that the place is secure. 
After 167 days on leave, Daniel Domilovo is expected to return tomorrow, March 3, 2021, to continue his work. What remains to be seen is what will become of a legal action taken in his defense following the president's directive. Right, so as I indicated earlier, we have uh, cited correspondence between the Audit Service and the Auditor General on this matter. And we'll be sharing that with you. Uh, and Ernest Main will be joining me. He has, that's it, of correspondence. But we also have on the lines uh, the co chair of the Citizens Movement Against Corruption, Edem Senanu, who will be speaking to, uh, because he's one of those, one of the civil, civil society organizations that's been counting down the days to the return of Daniel Domlovo uh, back to his post. But Ernest Menu, you have a set of uh, a copy or copies of the correspondences between the Audit Service and the Auditor General. So let's start with uh, what exactly these letters say. What's uh, the very so, first one you'd like to share with us? Yeah, so we'll start with the letter from the board chairman uh, that's Professor Edward Ajiman Dia, uh, Dia Ajiman, uh, you know, writing to Daniel Domelevo, inviting him for a special meeting All right. with the audit board. Now, in this letter, uh, Mr. Dia Ajiman says that information made available to the board, amongst others, um, so that there are disparities in your date of birth and place of birth that obviously have effect on the date of your compulsory retirement from the service in accordance with Article 1191 of the 1992 Constitution, in accordance with Section 62 of the Audit Service Act 2000, the Board Service kindly invites you to a special meeting on Friday, the 26th of February, 2021, at 10 a.m. in a Board in the Board Conference Room to resolve these matters. So that is the first letter written uh, from the Board and signed by the Board Chairman to Mr. Demolova. He then responds. In a letter dated the 26th of February 2021. Now, in this letter, Mr. Domelova says, I refer to your letter with reference number states um, on the above subject matter. And the above subject matter here is invitation for a special meeting with the board of the audit service. All right. Now, he says, You stated in the letter under reference that, quote, information made available to the board shows that. That disparities in your date of birth and place of birth that obviously have effect on the date of your compulsory retirement from the service in accordance with Article 119 of the 1992 Constitution. And this is quoting directly from the letter of the uh, board chairman of the audit service. Now, he goes on to say that whereas the information you allegedly have is false and completely irrelevant for purposes of reckoning the time of my retirement, compose or otherwise, you are reminded that the board is not my appointing authority. So Daniel de Malavo, for the first time in this letter, and you see that run through the other uh, document I'll be showing you, uh, reminds the board that uh, the board is not the appointing authority. And so that is his response. Now the board writes back Israel on the issue of the disparities uh, that they raised in the initial uh, letter to him. This time they give details of the, uh, those disparities they talk about as far as his personal records are concerned. Now, it is a six-paragraph letter, and I'll take it one by one. The first paragraph says, records at the Social Security and National Insurance Trust, that's NIT, completed and signed by you, indicate that your date of birth is the 1st of June, 1960, and that is when you joined the scheme. You joined the scheme on the 1st of October, 1978. Now, the second point says that the records show that you stated your tribe as Togolese and non-Ghanian. That is, that your hometown is at the Paragraph 3. On the 25th October 1993, you completed and signed a SNED change of beneficiary nomination form, stating your date of birth as 1st June 1961 instead of 1st June 1960, which you stated on your SNED membership uh, member registration application card number 37277019. When you joined the scheme on October 1, 1978, while working with the Ghana Education Service in Prior. So now on October 25, 1993, you completed and signed a SNIT change of beneficiary nomination form stating your nationality as Ghanaian 
and your hometown as Adan in the greater Accra region. The date of birth of your Ghanaian passport, uh, number A454800, issued on the 28th of February 1996, is the 1st of June 1961. And the place of birth is stated as Kumasi in the Ashanti region. The final paragraph in this letter says that on the 8th of August 2012, you were issued with a Ghanaian passport, number G0367080, which again showed your date of birth as the 1st of June 1961. So in this particular letter, the board uh, details those disparities they talk about as far as specifically his date of birth is concerned and where he comes from and other details as far as his personal records are concerned. They asked him to reply All right. within 24 hours. So Mr. Damolovo does that. Okay. And he tries to set the record straight. So he replies, and uh, I'm interested in what he had to say in response to all that, that the order said had raised in the previous letter. And so in his response, uh, we have here a seven-page, uh, a seven-paragraph response uh, to that uh, letter written by the Audit Service uh, Board uh, on his disparities. The first one, he gives a background of his family and how he came by the hometown at Betterfair. And he says that my grandfather, the late Martin Domela Votete, belonged to the Boy Do Wim or Boy Do House, which is part of the Dande Biawe clan. Now, he was a native of Adai in the greater Accra region of Ghana, who migrated to Togo and stayed in Adbotafe, and that is the hometown. My late father, Augustine Domelevo, migrated from Togo to the then Gold Coast. He stayed in several towns and or villages before finally settling in Kweu, Ademra. Either my father wrongly mentioned Adbotafe in Togo as his hometown to me, or I misconstrued it at the time. And that is the first explanation. Right. Now, the second explanation says, my mother is also Ghanaian. And that's all he says in that paragraph. All right. But that let's... paragraph, he goes on to say that, according to your letter, yes, Israel. Yes, I want us to go straight to the issue of the discrepancy or disparity with the date of birth. Great. So when it comes to the date of birth, uh, that is uh, from paragraph 5 to 7. Uh, paragraph 4, actually. Paragraph 4 says, with regards to the date, uh, 1960, uh, on the, well, that's my date of birth, I noticed a mistake when I checked my information with the baptismal register of the Catholic Church in Adema. The register has Yao as part of my name and also provides my date of birth as 1st June 1961. This corresponds with Thursday or Yao, the day of the week on which I was born. And he gives the contact details of the parish priest for Ademra uh, if, we, if the board wishes to reconcile those details and make their own checks. All right. Now, in the third paragraph, he goes to the issue of the passport, which also has some discrepancy with the board talks about. And the board, is, he says that my passport and my birth certificate bear the correct date of birth, which is 1st June 1961. And then the third paragraph says, if affidavits or a legal instrument was required, then I am sure I provided them. Otherwise, Snape would have effected the changes. All right. The very final paragraph in response to this uh, discrepancy issue is that with regards to the place of birth, I was born in Kumasi and my mother in less than a week. Uh... All right, we obviously seem to be having some challenges with you, but I am also very much interested in the very last correspondence which uh, has come through. Apparently, it's data today, and the audit service is making, uh, taking a particular position on it. Is, uh, uh, Ernest, if you have that, uh, could you just tell us exactly what the audit service is saying? All right, so we have that on your screens right now. It says, records made available to the board indicates that your retirement was June 1, 2020. And as far as the audit service is concerned, you're deemed to have Retired. Let's go on to Zoom now. I told you that we have uh, the co-chair of the Citizens Movement Against Cor Cor Corruption, Edem Senanu, uh, for more on this. Now, Mr. Senanu, I thank you very much for joining us. Uh, now, you, uh, one of those who had been anticipating that uh, Mr. Yao Dumbel, uh, Daniel Domlevo was 
to get back to his post uh, tomorrow. Now, what's your take with all that's happening now? Well, um, thank you. Uh, not too surprising. I think that this trend of uh, events, uh, the ding dong between the chairman of the audit service board, who seems to have a personal vendetta with the current auditor general, Daniel Domlevo, uh, has been ongoing. It's It's been from the very first year. Um, not So therefore, not too surprising. Um, I think that the the thing that would probably be an issue for most of us is uh, one is not expecting that the board chair would want to suggest that Mr. Daniel Domlevo should not go to his office tomorrow. We expect to see him in his office tomorrow. If there's some investigation they want to do to see whether his passport is genuine or not, uh, that's uh, an issue to be dealt with whilst the man is in office. Um, to all extents and purposes, once you have a passport, the passport processes require cross-checking of the supporting documents. Um, people cannot suggest that he's not a Ghanaian. I think that some of this begins to become comical, and we should not be finding ourselves in this position at this point. All right. Now, you have, we've all heard from the audit service indicating that, uh, well, he's supposed to have retired, per their records, he's supposed to have retired sometime last year. Knowing very well that he's already been there once to want to have access to his office and he had a challenge, do you anticipate that he or do you believe that he going there tomorrow is good advice? Well, I, 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 I'm not sure about the advice. I mean, when he went and the doors were locked, he was not confronted. There was no violence. Uh, indeed, that was also a very strange situation because he said the keys were with the sec uh, secretary uh, because of the security issue. And then the secretary said she gave it to the director. And then the director said they left it somewhere. And one was wondering, didn't they have a chief of security who could have kept the keys for the security issue? I mean, there was no violence. He should just walk there. Yeah. Uh, it will give media more reportage, and we all hear what happened. <laughs> you know, it's okay. So that's a, the point I'm actually making is he went there when he was supposed to be on leave, and he couldn't have access to his office. Now that he's deemed to have gone on retirement, do you anticipate that he's going to have uh, much better access than when he was on leave? And for which reason I'm asking, would it be advisable for him to actually go there? Well, I would not want to speculate. I mean, if you ask me and many of us in good governance and anti-corruption, we want the man back. So we, he should go to the office and whatever transpires to be part of the history of this country. Um, we are clear in our minds that we need strong men and women like uh, Daniel Domlevo in that kind of position to get the results we've seen from him. Uh, it's unfortunate that we seem to undermine our very own when they are doing very well under circumstances that are very much contrived and do not augur well for the collective good of this country. It's a shame. But let's see how tomorrow pans out. If you ask me my advice, Mr. Daniel Domlevo, please report at your office tomorrow. This story of uh, uh, you are not a Ghanaian, you are Togolese, uh, especially when he's Yao, and he's able to demonstrate that Yao actually fits the 1st June 1961. I'm sure if you go to 1st June 1960, you don't get a yell. So um, a basic analysis of this is just saying it's a storm in a teacup. All right. And there's a personal vendetta somebody has. It's, a, it's a surprising that it has taken such a turn of our events for somebody who's done such a good job for this country. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Adam Senanu, uh, for making time to speak with us. And our checks uh, indicate that uh, Mr. Yao Domilovo, the Auditor General, intends to be in his office or go to the office yesterday. And so we'll be watching this space to see how it pans out. But we also uh, have, uh, we're learning that some members of parliament have been reacting to this very story. We have those reactions. We'll be sharing that with you. Still ahead in the bulletin, members of parliament appointments committee suspend the recommendation for approval of six of President Kufado's ministerial nominees, including the three the minority MPs rejected. On whether they are arrogant or not, we are simply in respect of some persons demanding 
better particulars in respect of some roles they played in their public life to appreciate it. So chairman will be inviting the nominees to meet the committee, but essentially not uh, in camera. Now, up next, we're bringing you business news. Do stay tuned in. Hello, good evening. It's time for business with me, Charles Aite. Ghana's COVID-19 vaccination campaign has been launched. And of course, more people got the jobs today, including the president of the Ghana Union of Traders Association, Dr. Joseph Obin. He spoke to Joy Business on the need for businesses to partake of this national program. First and foremost, um, it is very important for my very self and my family to do this exercise. And um, I thought I was coming to see a long queue with uh, uh, frustrations, but it's so simple in here. And I'm ha very happy that I've also taken my job. And the first job, and I, um, I've been given um, next two uh, months or so to come for the, um, the second one. Um, what I'm doing here now, talking to the media, is to encourage all a trading community that there's a lot of confusion out there, especially through the social media, a whole lot of lies being peddled around this um, vaccination. And uh, we want to do this to encourage that your leaders have confidence in this um, vaccination. And that's why we've come in to take the head of state, the president himself has taken his. You also know that Otunfo and other uh, state personalities are doing this. So this will encourage all of you, because other prominent countries, civilized nations and all that have done this exercise and they did it even first before Africa um, uh, started. So the, the rumor and the stories, the lies out there that um, some people want to wipe us away and all that is not true. This is not the first time that we are taking vaccinations. We've done it so many years. I was young. Those days we, want to, we, we had to kill at the sports stadium and all that. And that's the reason why most of us have survived through life to, till today. Uh, remember that last year when um, the disease, um, the outbreak started, we went on lockdown and most of businesses were affected. If this thing escalates, if the upset, uh, the search goes on unabated, it means that we cannot do our business. So let's do everything to ensure that we put this disease behind us so that we can do our business and then better our lot. Well, meanwhile, private sector fund is working with government on an initiative to purchase COVID vaccines on the open market. The PVAX project aims to procure and deploy these vaccines to up to 20% of the eligible population. This is to support government's vaccination program. George Raffi has more. The COVID-19 private sector fund, the same initiative that helped build the country's first infectious center, is now turning to another social and philanthropic service in the country. The PVAX initiative is hoping to buy these COVID-19 vaccines through the World Health Organization, the Gavi Vaccine Alliance and the COVAX platform and deploy them to workers and their dependents as well as the poor and the vulnerable in society. It is therefore asking Ghanaians to go to their website and register to participate in this project and choose the number of persons they want to vaccinate. It adds that the purchase and flight cost as well as transportation will be borne by the private sector, whilst the Ghana Health Service will be in charge of administering the vaccines. They believe that this initiative will help sustain productivity at the workplace and the economy as a whole. Dr. Franklin Asidi Bequing is the Director of Public Health at the Ghana Health Service and has been given more details about this initiative between the private sector and government. They are trying to get 6 million Ghanaians vaccinated. So there's a component of the COVAX facility, which is not the free time. There's a part more of private sector led. The idea is that they want to get this um, 6 million Ghanaians vaccinated. And what they want to do is that it's the Ministry of Health which is leading it. And when we get, they get access to those vaccines, then a portion will come to them whilst the government is still in charge of its portion. Because, you know, we are doing segmentation. So maybe if, assuming you are not in the first or second group, or you are rather in the third, and because it's private sector-led, then somehow they get preference to their, their, their workers. 
The COVID-19 private sector fund believes that this initiative would help government in managing the virus because of its impact on the economy and private firms that are currently operating in the country. And that's it for business. Sports is up next. Many thanks for staying with us here on Joy News Prime. Time to bring you sports. My name is Hans Mengsand of FIFA. They've sent a final warning to Zamalek to pay $1.1 million to Bernard Champon uh, in what a player describes as being treated like an animal. Zamalek claimed they paid $250,000 US dollars, believed to be a settlement agreement between the parties. But FIFA's disciplinary committee rejected their claim and have asked them to pay the player in full. Ghana striker is yet to receive any amount since the Court of Arbitration for Sport ordered the five-time African champions to pay him via a ruling on December 8th last year. While expecting to receive his approximately $1.1 million, Zamalek in early February wrote to FIFA announcing a settlement with a player's agent in which a champion had supposedly agreed to accept $250,000. Zamalek engaged a champion's former agent, Nada El Said, in what has turned out to be a nefarious act of falsifying papers purporting to enable the ex-Egyptian international to deal with a club on behalf of the Ghanaian. Last week, FIFA revisited the case through his representatives and FIFA reported the latest conduct of the 12-time Egyptian champions. FIFA, on Monday, March 1, has served both parties, including the Egyptian FA, its latest decision, directing to pay a champion a whole outstanding amount stated in the recent cash ruling. Zamalek have been further sanctioned with a fine of 30,000 Swiss francs and given a final deadline of 30 days to pay the 30-year-old striker. The club will suffer an automatic imposition of worldwide transfer ban and a deduction of points or relegation to a lower division may also be considered in addition to the ban if it fails to meet the final deadline. Well, Akwata folk um, find themselves uh, in a new era. They have a new coach in Samo Buedu who has uh, replaced Costa Papich, who left his post unceremoniously. But Chairman Togwia Fede says he will be given the room to work with minimal interference. We'll provide him with all the resources to be able to build the systems that he needs to succeed. Resources to enable him to do all the analysis that needs to be done. We have plans to rebuild our scouting system. We will count on him to help us to build the appropriate system. Remember, our academy will have under 15s, under 17s, and under 20s. We need to scout for all of those people from across the country. We already had plans also to build satellite academies in other countries. Okay, so our network for pulling talent, for discovering special football talent is going to be very wide. And we expect Coach Buedo to be part of the development of that scouting network. So we'll give him all the conditions that, you know, he needs to thrive, okay? And we will work with him to develop the systems and the structures that will bring success to both him and to us. So that again together we'll succeed. So that five years again from now, we can all look back and thank God for this day. Thank you all very much. I'll be off and I'll bring you more sports later in the bulletin. My name is Hans Mensando. Now, scores of dignitaries and other high-ranking government officials took their shots of COVID-19 vaccines on the first day of the exercise. In all, some 43 districts, including cutting across the Greater Accra, Shante, and Central Regions, commenced a targeted inoculation program as part of the goal of vaccinating at least 20 million Ghanaians before the end of the year. A day after the president and his vice, together with their spouses, received the jabs, key dignitaries, including former President Mahama, Asante Hine, Gamanche, and other high-ranking officials, also took the jabs to begin the exercise. Health professionals 
are confident the vaccines will lead to a major decline in infections. Manuel Corantin reports. The vaccines deployed on 2nd March are part of the first batch of 600,000 doses of AstraZeneca jabs, which were delivered to Ghana under the COVAX facility on February 24. As intimated by President Kufuado in his 24th address to the nation, priority is being given to frontline health and security personnel, persons with underlying conditions, essential government officials and some media personnel. Ahead of the commencement of the exercise today, several concerns were raised about the safety of the vaccines. But few eyes into the exercise. Several high-profile personalities showed up to take the shots publicly, dismissing the alleged conspiracy theories around the vaccines. Taking his first shot. A message to everybody that these vaccines are safe and that all the funny rumors that are going around on social media are just hoaxes and that people should um, ignore them. This position by Mr. Mahama was re echoed by former Speaker of Parliament, Professor Mike Okwe. It's nothing wonderful, and it is just a matter of scientific development. And I will plead with all others who are skeptical kindly let us do the right thing and let us stop worrying over all one of things. You know, in this country, even superstition, if you follow superstition to a certain degree, you won't go to even the hospital. When, when you are sick, everything, you will give it all manner of interpretations. And for some time in this country, nobody dies for nothing. Everybody who dies is because of spirit is after him or her. For senior citizens like E.T. Mensa, Perio Kujetu, and Professor Margaret Amwakohene, all of whom are members of the Council of State, the vaccines do not present any major threats to recipients. When the job was put there, Within seconds, it was over. And then you go and sit for 10 minutes for them to find out whether you feel dizzy or there will be some reaction. There was no, for me, there was no reaction. I feel good and I recommend it for every Ghanaian. I would wish that everybody would take their vaccination and ensure that at least we kind of protect ourselves against this virus, which is killing so many people every day. Um, and I hope that we will stop the misinformation and let people know that really if it was deadly, you will not have your president going to take it or even importing it into this country. And we just want to disabuse people's mind and say that all those are lies. They should not believe any of it. The vaccination is an important ingredient. You take it, at least if you are attacked, you have the chance of survival. Sharing her personal experiences after taking the jabs, Chief of Staff Akosia Fremont Paris said she wished the jabs had arrived earlier to save all those who succumb to the disease in the country. I know people who have died, people I'm close to. So I know the pain that it has inflicted on the family and friends. If they had this opportunity, they will be alive today for all of us. To, in uh, all, 309,000 doses of the vaccines so me, have been deployed across 325 vaccination thing. sites in 25 districts considered to be hotspots in the greater Accra region. Reporting for Joy News, Manuel Kranting. In the central region, the vaccination exercise took place in the Wutu Senya West constituency, one of the most affected districts in the region. Richard Kodunyako reports the first day of the exercise was a huge success as traditional leaders pledged to get their people to get vaccinated. It was a busy day here at the Wutu Senya as health officials, the police and other heads of department were vaccinated. Beyond the vaccination, the people were sensitized to accept the exercise as one of the key ways of reducing the spread of the virus. Central Regional Director of Health, Dr. Akusia Sapon, revealed more than 2,900 people have so far been infected in the central region with the active case counts around 300. She spells out how the exercise would be rolled out in the region. Obia or falling under the category one. That is Omoa, Omoenya more than 60 years. Those who are taking part in this exercise, anyone that falls in category one, those who are more than 60 years, those hypertensive patients should avail themselves to be vaccinated. Beyond this, we have to observe the protocols by wearing the mask and washing our hands. Now, be face masks. No, now, eh, 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 si si empapa imuno. 
Boko Swa Papa Yumu. DC for Wutu Senior West, Stephen Kwee asked the residents to turn out in their numbers to take part in the exercise. He says that's one of the surest ways of reducing the spread of the virus. And it's even going to protect us. As I said, the president did it yesterday. We are also in the rural communities. We have also done it. Uh, our paramount chief is here, our police commander, regional director of health. They were all here, they've taken this. So I just want to assure them that we have done it. So they should also do. What we have to do as a district to also strengthen the education and then communication so that the fears that people have the perception will be off. This is about your life. It is safe, as we all know, as we've also taken. After that, it doesn't mean that if you are vaccinated, we will throw away the precautionary measures. The Omahin of Ewutu traditional area, Nai Ajiman Wete Otabo, after being vaccinated, said he was going to serve as an ambassador for the exercise. I have come here to take this to show example to others that it is not dangerous, it is good for, for us um, because if we don't do such, if we don't do that, it will bring a disaster if the COVID enter Awutu here, many people will die. By, by taking the vaccine, it will save people's life. So I, I will advise the citizens of Awutu to take the vaccine. The regional health directorate will in the coming days roll out an elaborate plan for the exercise. Richard Kujinyakon, Joy News. Now, police have arrested an entertainment prefect of the Nalurugu Nursing and Midwifery College for violating COVID-19 rules by organizing a dancing competition on the school campus. The police confirmed that the student leader was arrested Monday and taken into custody following an invitation by the principal of the college over the matter. Northeast Regional Correspondent Ilias Tanko has more. This morning what we have done is to invite the principal of, of the training college uh, in the person of Valentin Ayamba. So uh, he was invited and we have questioned him. He actually confirmed that indeed such a program took place, but it was done uh, without the school's approval. In other words, the school authority did not approve of such a program. And uh, but he indicated to us that on the Saturday evening, he himself was in office when he saw signs that the students were about organizing an entertainment program uh, of which he called out the entertainment prefect. He was championing affairs at the time and asked him not to go ahead with any program because of the restrictions regarding uh, COVID-19. And so he, having done that, uh, he thought that that could be the end of it. However, uh, the program continued uh, until close to 10 p.m. there about that, he finally came with one other person to actually put a halt to it. But between the early hours, like 7.30 p.m. to that 10 p.m., some program had taken place and uh, there was quite a mass that dream over there. And so he made mention of the entertainment prefect, whom we have also invited, and presently he is with us. We are interrogating him to ascertain why he did so uh, in contravention with the restriction orders. The students on Saturday night organized a competition which brought together hundreds of people despite COVID-19 restrictions. The crime officer said the entertainment prefect was arrested because the school principal named and identified him as the one responsible for the organization of the illegal event. And when questioned by the police, according to the crime officer, the entertainment prefect admitted but claimed he organized the event to prevent rioting and agitation by the students on campus. According to this entertainment prefect, 
I will not be able to put the details out for now because of the investigation which has just commenced. But then he says uh, he was organizing an entertainment program for and the first year student who have reported barely a month ago and who complained about having paid entertainment fees but nobody is entertaining them at the school. So he decided that he wants to organize such a program for them in order to calm down their kind of agitations. Yes. With the police already in possession of several evidence of the program, the crime officer indicated the police will base on the outcome of the ongoing investigation to make a determination on whether or not to press formal charges and prosecute the suspect who is currently behind bars. When we come to the end of the conclusion, uh, uh, in the end of the investigation, we will determine what uh, final action we should be taking against him. We could take him to court. We could, it could take another uh, form of uh, action. It could be a warning. Uh, judging from the point of the, from the fact that he is a student, it could be any other thing that we will make a decision on. Now, now the news members of Parliament Appointments Committee have unanimously agreed to hold on with their recommendation for the approval of six of President Tekufuado's ministerial nominees, including three of those the minority MPs on the committee says they would not approve. The six are Information Minister designates Kojo Pong Kruma, Fisheries and Aquaculture Minister designates Hawa Kum Singh, and Agriculture Minister designate Dr. Wusu Efriye Kuto, who the minority says is rejecting. So these are the three. Now the rest are Communication and Digitalization Minister designates Esla Wusu Ekofu, Attorney General and Justice Minister designates Godfred Dame and Minister-designate for Roads and Highways, Kwesi Amakwata. Minority Leader Haruna Idritu, who read the decision of the committee, said the fate of these nominees will be determined based on how they respond to a number of queries. He starts by strongly indicating this is the decision of the entire committee and not the minority. In respect of the Honorable Howard Kumsen, as many of you may recall, she was on this floor of Parliament when we asked her about the status of the shooting incident she said it was still under investigation and she has not been charged therefore we require further information in taking a decision on her if we are satisfied that the investigative process were conclusive bearing that we have every right to raise a red flag on her in respect of dr Ousu afriye akoto there are many reasons as i've said chairman will reach out to them we are unhappy about the termination of a contract at the ghana ports and harbors authority which has occasioned some loss and a major disincentive to foreign investors uh, some Dutch businesses have expressed concern about it and will require further information from uh, him. In respect of the Honorable Kojo Upon Nkuma, we are carefully reviewing the tape of his answers to our questions to appreciate the issues. But it had to do with over microfinance and the official position of the Bank of Ghana on it. We require clarity from the Bank of Ghana as to whether he owes or not. There is a matter relating to a media house that is also being looked at. In respect of the Honorable Kweku Ajima Menu, we demand that somebody must be responsible for the procurement of the Frontiers Healthcare Services Limited, which is charging Ghanaians $150 at the port. We seem not to be getting satisfactory answers as to how the procurement process was done and completed. We've had some evidence of some information of renting of offices in it. He has to respond to it, including the La Polyclinic that I may be visiting shortly to appreciate the state of work at the lab polyclinic. In respect of uh, Honorable Osla Ousu, she gave some assurances uh, regarding the contract with uh, Kelvin GVG. We are looking at it in terms of the monthly issue, but as I've said, her clarification on some matters relative to the closure of some radio FM stations. Kwesi Amakwata is just to respond to the issue of a PPP contract which was signed uh, for the Tema Motorway expansion, which figures increased from uh, 400 and 
80 million dollars to 570 under PPP. There's no cabinet or parliamentary approval, and a PPP law has been signed. Honorable Godfrey Dami will also respond to some matters relative to his role at the PPA. So let it not be said anywhere that the appointments committee, particularly led by the minority, are assessing people based on whether they are arrogant or not. We are simply in respect of some persons demanding better particulars in respect of some roles they played in their public life to appreciate it. So, Chairman will be inviting the nominees to meet the committee, but essentially not uh, in camera. We'll deal with them at our committee level. But Committee Chairman Jose also described as an act of bad faith comments by some minority MPs claiming to have rejected three of the nominees. The first Deputy Speaker noted the committee has no power to reject any nominee. NDC MP for Atuase Muntaka Mubarak told during news yesterday his side rejected three nominees. But Jose Wusu says that cannot be correct. Yesterday at the meeting here, none of these matters were discussed. Yeah. It is this morning that these matters were forwarded to me by mm -hmm. the Chief Whip, Deputy Ranking Member. Some of them, I look at them myself and I compare with the answers that we're giving. They are not matching the issues that are led to have been raised. So I, I encourage you to stay away from making public pronouncements on things which undermine the integrity of this committee. If you go out to say a person said A, B, C, D, E, for which reason we are doing what X, Y, Z. But the video shows clearly that he did not say the things he allegedly said. And you purport to speak on behalf of a committee which has not asked you to. You purport to be a, a, a decision of a committee which has not taken any such decision. I think it was for good reason that the leadership decided that these are the matters. We discussed them. We agreed. We we'll move on. Those matters are you. Matters you said you wanted further clarification. But before the matters reached me, they were already being discussed. In the media. I think it is most unbecoming of us, any one of us who participated in this, who uh, created the discussion. Indeed, by outstanding others, one of the acts which can bring you to um, uh, uh, the Privileges Committee is discussing matters at a committee which is intended for the House but has not reached the House. Sometimes people say I'm too strict, I'm too... But truly, that, that's my training. These are the rules, we go by it. So please, let us work as a team, as a committee. We can always agree to disagree. And that's why it is a democracy. But we should not take out of here matters which have not been decided by the committee and discussed as if they are committee. This committee has no power to de reject anybody. Twelve more persons in Parliament have tested positive for COVID-19. This was after retesting of 550 MPs and parliamentary service staff before the House resumed sitting from a three-week break following the outbreak of the virus in the House. The Speaker of Parliament, Alban Sumana Bagbing, made this announcement when sitting resumed on Tuesday. The retesting revealed that out of a total of 500 and 50 MPs and staff who retested, only 12 tested positive and are currently in isolation. Majority of them were auxiliary staff. This represents a positivity rate of 2%, which compares favorably with the national positivity rate of between 10 to 12 percent. It is my expectation that all honorable members and staff who are required to retest actually do submit themselves for the testing. As shown by the results of the retesting, the measures we put in place, including the three-week break, have enabled our colleagues who were exposed to the virus to overcome the infection. 
for those of us who are not so exposed, it has been an opportunity for us to reassure ourselves of our status. As we resume today, I believe we will all endeavor to adhere to the time-tested protocols that the COVID-19 pandemic requires of all of us. Well, President Akufuado is expected to address Parliament on the State of the Nation on Tuesday, March 9, 2021. Friday, March 12, will be scheduled for the budget presentation. The House will also be privileged to receive His Excellency the President, Nana Adodankwa Akufuado, who is obligated by Article 67 of the Constitution to deliver to Parliament a message on the state of the nation at the beginning of each session of parliament and before a dissolution of parliament. His Excellency has given an indication to me that he is ready to meet the obligation on Tuesday, 9th March 2021. Still within this meeting, in accordance with Article 179 of the Constitution, his Excellency has given further indication that he is called to be prepared and is ready to be presented and laid before this House the budget for the 2021 financial year on Friday, 12 March 2021, for consideration and approval. Now, soil erosion has become an increasing concern as climate change destroys soils due to droughts and floods. But the practice known as conservation agriculture does not only protect the soil, but saves farmers time and money. Join us is Mahmoud Mohamedouddin looks at how the system is implemented and the benefits farmers will derive from it if adopted. A farmer tills the soil. The age-old practice to till the soil is a means of preparing the seed base, releasing nutrients to crops and controlling weeds. But tillage poses a greater risk of erosion with potentially disastrous consequences. The loss of topsoil destroys farmlands and causes environmental pollution. Global soil degradation issues are compounded by climate change. Frequent extreme weather events have an increased impact on land degradation. Because of the rapid release of greenhouse gases, soil degradation is responsible for climate change. But there is a solution, conservation agriculture. And over the years we have seen that there's been a lot of um, climate impact on agriculture. And uh, we've seen that the only way to ensure food security in our part of um, the country and to the large extent in sub-Saharan Africa is to adopt the system of conservation agriculture. Um, we have seen that adapting the conservation agriculture system helps in improving the soil fertility. And in that, you, you plant, you harvest all the residuals that is not needed. You slash it, leave it on top of the soil so that as it decomposes, whatever nutrient that it picks from the soil, it gives it back to the soil. So the only thing that you send home is the crop produce that um, you have harvested. But the, all the leftovers, you leave it on top of the soil so that the microbes in the soil will also serve as food for them. And as they eat it, go in and out of the soil, they create a whole lot of um, um, micropores in the soil, um, enhancing aeration and infiltration in the soil. And this is what helps in making the soil very fertile. Farmers do not plow the soil, nor disturb it to restore its structure and ecosystem. They leave crop residue in the field to reduce soil erosion, evaporation and manage weeds. Farmers diversify rotational species to enhance soil resistance to pests and diseases. This allows farmers to reduce the number of pre-season operations. Plot that is actually dedicated to, um, to experiment on bare fields and also lands that um, we practice the conservation agriculture system. 
and uh, in the first year that we did that research side by side crop um, slash and burn field and a no-till field the first rain that we had on that field with the slash and burn we lost about 30 earthworms on the first rain that we had but with the land that we practiced the no-till we lost only two earthworms which tells you that the bare fields because of the bare nature of the soil the raindrop impact always will hit the soil and try to move the soil uh, particles and this goes along to move all the earthworms but we realized that on the no-till field we lost only two earthworms which means that moisture retention was very high and also the earthworms um, population also being intact we also there are added benefits to saving money and enabling more efficient and timely management of farm practices. Conservation agriculture reduces soil erosion and makes farmland more productive. If the soil contains more organic matter, it acts like a sponge. It is challenging to change an age-old practice like tilling the soil, but the benefit of conservation agriculture can keep farmers productive for the next generation. A report by Mohamed Nuruddin. Now what will you do when pupils you are teaching prefer to sing and dance to songs from a different class? Do you wait for them to finish singing or you continue teaching? That is the dilemma teachers at the Wa Model Kindergarten and the Wa Municipality find themselves in. Join us this Upper West correspondent Rafiq Salam who visited the school as an account of how the teachers are handling the situation. This building would now serves as a KG block for the older school in the one municipality used to serve as a storeroom for the school. But now it has been partitioned into four parts and you can see clearly one of the classrooms is not as big as somebody's bedroom. The one municipal model kindergarten has a pupil population of 244 and are unevenly shared among the four partisan classrooms. None of the classrooms are up to the size of a normal classroom. In fact, without the teaching aids drawn over the walls, one could have mistaken it for pen for sheep and goods. Yet, this is where the pupils who are tagged as future leaders of the country are going to spend their formative years at. There's actually no space in the classrooms for the instructors to work freely during instructional periods. Instead of two pupils seated at a dual desk, they have made a tray. Few of the pupils wore no marks, thus making nonsense and throwing the safety health protocols for COVID-19 disease to the dogs. Ventilation in the classrooms is poor and with a warm season already knocking at their door, there is fear of an outbreak of cerebrospinal meningitis. Teachers at the kindergarten refuse to speak to us on the unconducive and chaotic learning environment at the kindergarten for fear of being victimized. Our cameras have ever captured this worrying and interesting spectacle. Chaotic here, right here at the KG2. Though the teacher is not here, but they are listening with rap attention, whatever that's going on here. And so, even when they are, they are singing, the bottom is not here, but they are singing after them at the other side. They have few recreational facilities. The few which are available are not also in good condition. The one municipal office of the Ghana Education Service said they are aware of the situation. They have, however, parried. The responsibility of fixing the challenges to the one municipal assembly led by its mayor, Alaji Sakotai Moment. Um, visiting the school tells you that it is not going to be easy for us when it comes to the, 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 the hot season. Yes, especially Upper West One Municipal having a, a history of CSM issues. It's a matter of concern for us. Whilst we'll be trying to implement a stopgap measure, at least to reduce the incidence of uh, CSM and other issues, we'll be looking at a permanent solution. 
and the permanent solution is to get them two separate kg blocks by this i know it's not going to be easy for us as we will be deploying our resources to that area the war model primary school formerly known as war experimental primary school is the oldest primary school in the upper west region and for that matter considered as a citadel of education for the people in its 104 year history it has produced prominent people who are working in various spheres in the country's development. Alaji Sakutai Momin noted that though the War Municipal Assembly will do its best to fix the challenges, he is calling on former students of the school to contribute their widow's might to help reduce the infrastructure deficit at the school. And to my knowledge, prominent person like um, the former finance minister in the SYL and the PNDC government, uh, Professor. Kwesi uh, Boetwe is an alumni of this school. We have our revered clergyman, a man of God, Duncan Williams, who also passed through this institution. So you see that they are not doing less for this country. They are doing so much, and these are people who have contributed immensely for the development of this country. So um, I think it will not be out of place if we call on such people at least to give their widow's might for the development of this school. And I think it will go into their honor. Now, the teachers are at their own ends. The best they can do under the circumstance is to continue teaching the pupils who prefer to listen and dance to songs from different classrooms other than taking instructions from the teacher in front of them. Reporting for the news. Rafik Salam. Wow. All right, we're taking a break here on Joy News Prime. We're bringing you more business to stay tuned in. And it's time for business. I'm Charles IT. Freight forwarders are sending a strong signal that they will be forced to seek legal redress if the Ghana Shippers Authority cannot stop shipping lines from increasing port charges on cargo. According to the Concerned Fruit Forwarders Association, the intended increment by the shipping lines expected to take effect today is unlawful and therefore must be withdrawn. The chairman of the association, Ohineba Kwesi Afamwa, addressed a press conference in Temam regarding this devel developing story. I spoke on... Uh your platform this morning directing shippers authority to issue a statement in connection with the subject matter which uh, per our information they have done that appealing, appealing to the shipping shipping lines that the, they should come and sit around at the round table with them so we are hoping that by the close of the day or two we are going to hear a positive sign of it if they refuse then our earlier submission saying we'll go to court, we shall go to court. And for first time, that will resist shipping lines for, I mean, in, uh, uh, increasing these charges to importers. So if they don't adhere to our directive or the shippers authority directive, uh, concern free for this, we'll go to court to... So now, Ghana's Kotoka International Airport has, for the second time, topped the ranking as Africa's best airport by size and region, with a passenger population of between 2 and 5 million by the Airport Council International Customer Experience Award. This is despite the impacts of COVID-19. And of course, with this particular situation, we've had that of Sean Mendes, the aviation expert formerly of Africa World Airlines, explain to us the meaning that this could have on the aviation sector. I think that this is actually a pretty big deal. Uh, you know, the ACI awards are effectively like the Oscar awards mm. of uh, for airports. So uh, the fact that that Kotoka International Airport has placed best in its category, not just once, but for the second year in a row, is definitely recognition that that KIA has effectively become the, uh, the, the de facto premier gateway to the West African region. And I think that's a, that's a big credit to Ghana Airports Company Limited, as well as to successive governments, and notably, you know, the last government and the last Ministry of Aviation headed by Kofi Adda, who took the right steps to, 
uh, you know, to to consult, to open the terminal and to ensure that it maintained its standards over the last three years now. Interesting. But, you know, in 2020, the Terminal 3 of the Kotoka International Airport, of course, was adjudged the, you know, the most reviewed uh, in terms of the regional and international long haul operators, the most improved airport in the year under review. Of course, it was not this time around. Why do you think this could have been the cause? What do you think could have been the cause to this? Well, the real reason for that is because ACI chose not to award most uh, improved category in 2020 uh, because of the pandemic and the related issues. They felt that, uh, you know, there was so much changing. But the reality is you won't get most improved two years in a row. Uh, Kotoka International Airport went from essentially in 20, uh, 2017 from, uh, sorry, 2018 awards being, well, uh, uh, probably middle of the pack. It was the most improved for uh, the 2018 award and again, sorry, the 2019 award and again mm. now uh, being recognized for 2020. Uh, despite the fact that air traffic has been growing, so it's not as though the airport is quiet or anything, there has been very strong traffic growth since 2017, 2018 and 2019. And in fact, even in 2020, Kotoka International Airport, due to some very good uh, you know, strategic positioning of itself, uh, was able to actually hold its own. Certainly traffic dropped from slightly over 3.1 million to just around one and a half million passengers last year. But uh, that is that is really nothing compared to uh, to to uh, what many other air, uh, airports around the world has done. And again, this was due to Ghana Airports Company making strategic decisions such as pitching uh, Accra as the World Food Program's cargo and uh, you know uh, humanitarian aid distribution mm. hub during the times of border closures and so forth. So so the right decisions have been taken, and I think this award is, is, is giving the right recognition to the people who have taken those decisions for doing the right thing. Away from the aviation sector, accounts and balances with banks and other financial institutions that have been dormant for three years are now being reconsidered under the Bank of Ghana. There is more in this report. The directive, however, reveals that these transfers can only be done after the commercial banks in question and the deposit-taking institutions notify the customer that this should be done three clear months before this action, with the necessary public notice in the dailies as well as the nest of kin of that customer duly informed. The Bank of Ghana, however, maintains that these funds can indeed be reclaimed but at no interest from them at the central bank. This is however done after a proper validation of the claims of the said customer. According to the central bank, it will not hesitate to sanction firms and financial institutions that fail to comply with this directive. It maintains that this directive is aimed at establishing a process to reclaim these funds as well as protect them. The directive ensures that commercial banks and other deposit-taking institutions are required to create a separate register where all these dormant accounts can be moved. The regulator believes that these are part of several measures that they are instituting to ensure a well-stabilized financial system and protect depositors' funds. Well, prices of food stuff are expected to decline marginally from this month. That's the projection from commodity research firm Isoko. This is coming after a spike in prices over the past two months. Content developer at Isoko, Frances Danso, says that he's been given reasons, actually, on the underpinning effects of this particular forecast. He, however, maintains that the worst situation will be prices remaining fairly stable on the market. If we do not get any external shocks. Supply, it's okay. The issue with tomato traders largely has been resolved. We are also about producers are preparing to produce for the coming season. And so fairly there is enough supply, which means that prices should fairly be stable. Even if we are going to see some increases, it shouldn't be that sharp increase in, in prices. And so with the arrival of the vaccines, we expect that people will begin to calm down and then production and other things will also be okay. I, I get two things from you. One bit about optimism and supply, but there have been instances where supply has picked up, but the, the, the funny aspect of it was that prices also went up. Uh, let's stick to the price factor here. 
do we see prices really being stable going forward despite all the dynamics looking favorable? You see, with pricing, you realize that you we will find some few market increasing prices. If you study the trend over the years, you realize that agribloshi has, has been one of the major markets where food prices are normally low. When you see prices from agribloshi moving up, it means that there are other dynamics within that local market that is affecting pricing. And so, yes, we will find some one or two markets increasing their prices. But if you put everything together, we are saying that the effect will be that we will have a fairly stable um, pricing um, um, over the period. And that'll be all for business. My name is Charles. IIT Sports is up next. Time to bring you the second installment of sports. I am Hans Mensa Andon. Let's get back to Accra to folk. And it's a new era for them with the appointment of Samuel Bodu as the new head coach of the side. A number of promises have been made. Among them is, you know, to build the club's academy, the under-15, under-17, and the under-20. Also, um, among the promises is uh, a promise not to interfere with the work of the new head coach. Samuel Bodu left Midyama after three years with the Takwa-based club. During his tenure, he led the Mauve and Yellows to sit at the top of the Premier League table for two consecutive seasons. However, the calendar was cancelled due to number 12, a documentary premiered in June 2018, exposing alleged corruption and match-fixing within the Ghanaian game, whilst the other was the COVID-19 pandemic, which brought world football to its knees last year. House of Oak had tried a couple of times to secure his services. Last year, the Phobians made contact with Samuel Bodu to replace New Odum before the arrival of Costa Papage, who left after just 78 days. Following the exit of Costa Papage, the hierarchy of the 2001 CAF Champions League winners reached out to Bodu, who resigned after the March Week 16 game against Tachima 11 Wonders. He has signed a three and a half years contract to steer the affairs of the club. Board chairman Togbe Afede, the 14th, who unveiled Bodu on Monday, said he will be given the room to work with minimal interference. We have only been involved as much as board of directors need to be involved. And that, I can assure you, would be the case going forward. We shall perform our board duties in the interest of the club, in the interest of each shareholders, and the interest of all other stakeholders. The decisions are his own. Okay, we have agreed that technical matters will be his responsibility. It does not preclude the board or the management from making appropriate recommendations, but those would be his domain. Bodu is excited for the opportunity to work for the 19 times Ghana Premier League champions, saying that it has been a dream to lead a major club like House of O. I was looking for this opportunity for quite long. And this is the time for me to be part of Phobia family. And I'm so, so proud of myself to be a head coach of Phobia. And what I would like to say, I'll bring out my best. I'll bring my heart out to work extra for the hustle folk. His first task is a game against West Africa Football Academy on March the 17th of the ongoing Ghana Premier League season. Well, that's it for sports, but it's half time between Manchester City and Wolverhampton Wanderers. One goal to nil. Manchester City lead. We'll bring you more on that later, 10 30 pm on Fun Zone. In the meantime, check out my jawonline.com forward slash sports for more sports news. My name is Hans Mengsan. Many thanks for your time. And that'll be it for the bulletin. I'm Israel. I thank you very much for watching. For more news, you can log on to myjoyonline.com or you can take this hashtag, uh, hashtag 7887, uh, and uh, get some more news from Etel.